we have, well, there's going to be four CEOs and two presidents. Um, there's also going to be a North, uh, sorry, a, a North America, a European divide with the Atlantic in the middle here. This is a still unified Europe currently. Um, no. Anyway, I'd like to welcome Peggy Smith, uh, CEO and President of uh, WERC. Uh, Steve Cryan, uh, President and CEO of CERC, the Canadian Employee Relocation Council. Morning, Ted. Thank you. And uh, uh, Jesse Van Sass, who I think is technically a Secretary General or something. Indeed. Of Indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, please. Um, we're going to discuss a number of things this morning. Um, issues and trends that are, like, uh, are likely to and may already face us here. However, before we sit and have our discussion, uh, Steve is going to get the ball rolling by presenting the results uh, from a recent survey conducted by Ipsos on behalf of CERC in partnership with Europe. Euro. This isn't the first time we've done this. Uh, we've cooperated before, and if you remember last year, Steve, uh, came and presented the findings of the report of all reports, the Future of Talent Mobility report. Um, this uh, basically raised a number of issues or showed a number of issues facing uh, 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 corporations and employers moving people around the world, ranging from cost to compliance to, the compl to complexity in terms of types of assignment um, and to employees themselves. It also looked at the nature of markets uh, showing that there's an increasing number of moves from less well-developed countries to more developed areas and went on to underline the difficulties that we have with governments who are not really doing enough uh, to cooperate with businesses in facilitating employee mobility. The good news was that CEOs overall predicted an increase in mobility generally. It also touched on the, uh, the employee perspective in terms of their willingness to move and uh, what might hold them back. So Steve, uh, if you'd like to go and give us, give us your little presentation. Yes, good morning. Really good. Thank you very much, Ted. It's a pleasure to be uh, here in Warsaw and with uh, many friends and colleagues that I've uh, come to know over the years. This is my sixth uh, Euro conference. I think oh. the first one was Stockholm. And, um, I also know that Friday morning is a challenge. So let's just do a very, I'm going to do a survey, the results of our survey in a few moments, but um, just a quick show of hands. Who got to bed before midnight last night? Okay, who got to bed before one o'clock last night? Before two o'clock last night? Three o'clock. <laughs> You're still standing, one, four o'clock. Oh, oh my goodness gracious. Have you been to bed yet? Okay, I dare not take it any further, or dare I? Five o'clock? Good. Well, you're very responsible adults. So, um, as Ted as, uh, uh, mentioned this morning, uh, I'm going to take about five or six minutes and just walk us through uh, this uh, report that, we've, that, we've, uh, that we commissioned with Ipsos Public Research uh, out of uh, Toronto in, uh, in Canada. Um, I'll speak about some of the details of that in, uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, but I think, you know, just teeing up the, the conversation, the discussion, it, it just demonstrates the, the need to have partnerships between uh, various associations uh, and various groups in order to bring forth uh, this, kind of, this kind of work. Um, and of course, that would not have been uh, possible without um, our partners. Uh, and uh, a number of you are associated with these companies, and I'd like to say thank you very much uh, for the support, that, uh, the financial support that you gave uh, to us in uh, pulling this study together. Um, the survey is, uh, we, we initially did the survey back in 2012, um, when we started to do uh, some benchmarking, and so this, this next iteration of the report, it's five years on, um, we, have, uh, we have some interesting findings uh, from the report. We reduced the, 
country size uh, for, this, for this outing. We re reduced it to uh, 20 countries. Um, and I'll show you, uh, where are we here? There we go. So these are the countries that were uh, surveyed, uh, ranging from Argentina, China, Canada, Brazil, Australia, the United States, the Netherlands. Um, there were t a total of 10,000, just over 10,000 people uh, in 20 countries. And the survey was completed between uh, February the 17th and March the 3rd. Um, it's statistically relevant. Uh, weighting was employed to balance demographics uh, right around uh, the globe uh, based on the country populations. What I've done for the purposes of this uh, discussion this morning is to just simply give you some highlights that I think will prompt further discussion with, uh, with my colleagues here. Um, and also, I think it will prompt some questions and discussions uh, from the audience. Um, there is no doubt that um, you know, things are changing, and I think this survey shows us that things have changed quite considerably um, over the last five years. So the questions that we ask in the survey are fairly simple. So um, in, the first, in the first section of the survey, we say, how likely would you be to consider moving for a new job in another country if you could have a minimum 10% increase in your pay and all your moving expenses paid, um, if you had to temporarily relocate for up to two years, or if you were to permanently relocate. So this next uh, slide gives us a sense in terms of the changes that are happening around the world. In 2012, the number of people that were very likely, that is that they would pack a bag tomorrow, uh, and move to another country, whether it's for permanent relocation or temporary relocation, was uh, just over 25%. Um, and we've seen that uh, drop now to 18%. Um, so it, statistically, that is, that is a significant drop. And if you start to look at the countries, what interests me is where uh, some of those countries now, um, you know, that we're seeing the declines in. So uh, Russia, 17% decline. Uh, China, 24% decline. Um, India, uh, India, 18% uh, decline. And we've always looked at some of these countries as being the source of our talent, the source of the, the resources that we need. And so I'm thinking, you know, that we've got a shift going on here. We're seeing that economies in some of these developing uh, nations are coming up. We're seeing the growth of the middle class. And so the need for movement to move to another country is not perhaps as great as it has been in the past. Um, so I think, that's a significant, I think that's a significant finding in our survey, is that the, the reluctance on the part of people uh, to pick up and, and move uh, has changed over that five-year period. We also asked questions about their agreement to relocate. So what are the incentives that uh, you would be interested in? So, um, this is a very interesting uh, finding. To, so the question was, to what extent do you agree with the following statements? And there were a series of statements, but I think the one that uh, stands out for me is, there is nothing, nothing that my employer could do to convince me to take an international assignment. Um, and again, you can see, although the numbers have declined, I think that's uh, partly because the number of people that have said that they would relocate uh, has also declined in tandem. But um, essentially what we've, what we've got is um, about 40% of employees globally say there's nothing. Money, incentives, the location, I just will not pick up and move. So for, um, for people that are in our industry, it means that we have to find new and innovative solutions to help those people to either relocate permanently or to accept a temporary assignment. So these are, I think, while we'll see it, well, we've got uh, some challenges here in terms of the number and willingness of people to move. I think it creates opportunities for our industry, and it's, very, it's, it's an exciting time to be a part of this industry as we're trying to find new and innovative um, solutions to the challenges that we have. 
Um, on the other hand, one of the next question was, I could be convinced to take an international assignment if the incentive package from my employer was right. And then in our report, we drill down to the kinds of incentives that people are looking for. I will say that uh, support for families and spouses by, uh, are, are very, very important factors that people are considering uh, when they're looking at relocating or taking a temporary assignment. Um, but um, you, you see that um, in total, if you get the incentive packages right, of those people that would be willing to move, the, they are um, more likely to accept the assignment uh, about 78% say that they would accept the assignment if the incentive packages uh, offered by the employer are, um, are right. In this survey, in the survey this year, we introduced a couple of new questions which I think are relevant in the environment in which we are in today. We asked about education, we asked about social, social security and healthcare, but the one that I think is most in, important in the discussion that we're having globally about uh, barriers to immigration, uh, the willingness of countries to accept uh, migrant workers. Um, so we asked a question that uh, around immigration. So to what extent do you agree I would only want to relocate to a country that is friendly to immigrants? And you can see overwhelmingly uh, people were selecting that this is an important factor to people in considering whether or not they are going to move. And then finally, where would they relocate to? What, what countries would they like to, um, would they like to move to? Um, and so um, these are the results of the, uh, of the findings. I think the significance of this, um, the United States is still number one, uh, the number one country where uh, people would, uh, would move to. Canada is, uh, is second. Uh, we're tied basically with Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, uh, and so on down the list. But you can see that the United States, there's been a change of 5% in the number of people that would be willing to, to move uh, to the US. And as we break that down by country, um, there are significant changes India, for example, China, uh, Mexico, um, they're down in the double digits. I think Mexico, for example, the number of people that said that they would move to the U.S. from Mexico is down by about 17 or 18 percent. So I think that there's some significant uh, statistical findings there uh, that are pointing us to you know, some, of the, some of the challenges and, and, and trends, I think, that are going on in our industry. We're going to try and track it back to the trends report that we did last year. Uh, and we'll be diving much deeper into the, uh, into the data that we, that we have and we'll be working very closely with, with um, folks, our colleagues and so on going forward. So that's, uh, that's just teeing it up, Ted, and I'll hand it back over to you and thank you. And I'm more than happy to take questions through the, uh, through the session. I, I think that we ought to give our friends here the opportunity to react to these findings. But I, what I do find fascinating about this is that the, the report of reports last year came out saying that employees were looking for better support in order to move, they were looking for more support. And this just basically adds to that and says, you know, this is what's necessary, which of course is good news for everybody in the room um, because there are more services out there to be offered, um, assuming corporates and employers will actually utilize them. Mm. But I just think that, um, and these, this is not the first time these guys have seen this, because if it was, uh, they would need a magnifying glass to read it properly. Um, they both had an opportunity to look through these findings. So I was wondering, Peggy, have you got any um, points that you'd like to raise or um, discuss from what Steve has come uh, has just said? Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tad, and thanks for having me on the panel. So um, I, I, when we sort of got our peek at these, and I said I wouldn't go political, but I, uh, <laughs> so I'm going I'm I'm to tread very gently here. Um, but I, I said to Steve, I said, when was the survey done? Was it done 
um, post the U.S. inauguration, not post the election, but post the inauguration, and, and sure enough, it was. So I think that um, some of the trends that you um, had in the survey relative to the United States lens, I think is, is right on with what, as an American citizen, we're sort of hearing. So we have a very strong pro-business administration, but a bit of behavior that is raising, I think, some concerns relative to immigration. Um, the H-1B visa, for those that are in the audience, is a very popular visa in the United States that is used for a lot of the high-tech uh, industry. So there are some changes on the horizon there. Um, but then I would say um, the other interesting thing relative to some of that is what's going to occur over the next, you know, nine to 12 months or certainly looking at this in a year from now because somebody's standing behind a podium and talking about immigration changes and getting that impacted are two different dynamics. But the whole point with that, I think, then ties into, well, then uh, was like, two weeks ago, I think Australia came out with the 457 changes that they want to make to their visa. So you're seeing, I think, a little bit of energy around some perhaps protectionism. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that's going to play out in these numbers and in our trends. So I, I think overall, though, as I share with my colleagues, the genie's out of the bottle. We are a global economy. But there may be sort of this typical swing the pendulum and swing it back. So that was my first observation relative to um, this. I'll, I'll let Jesse comment, and then I can yes. share some further insights around sort of peeling the onion outside of the, the geopolitical landscape around migration. I'll stay out of the political arena. That's, I'll leave that up to you. Um, one thing that stood out for me is apparently there's a, a creeping reluctance to move, right, uh, apparently, which is a bit in contradiction with the kind of trend that we see that young people want to move more and more. So I was wondering, Steve, and maybe you can tell me, there must be a difference in age, right, uh, according to the answers. How did, did that work out? Well, that was interesting because there's, there's not a significant difference between the, those that are most likely. There was not a significant difference. It's about, uh, I think it was 26% for senior executives and, and uh, about 25% for people under the age of 35. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we've all got this. We've all got this view that um, millennials, and I think you know, I think they do. But when you when you really ask people, you know, what's going to motivate you to move? Mm. Uh, those, I think, those are the significant factors. And maybe that is because the the, the, the traditional expats, as we know them, and, and those are the, the ones with families over 40, etc., they would see expatriation as a step in their career. Right. And very often they will become a career expat, so they will do assignment after assignment, whilst younger people, as I understand right now, they're looking for experiences. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a step in their career path, they just want to have an experience and perhaps go back again, and maybe later on they'll try something different. So I was wondering how that would play in this whole trend. I, I th and I think, that's, I think that's right. I think that the people that, um, younger people, two years is probably too much of a a long time, yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like, well, I'll go for a week or two, yeah, <laughs> just to get that global experience. But That's significant for, for, for our industry, isn't it? I yeah. mean, it yeah, I think so, the yeah. Scope. yeah I, I, and maybe it's the fact that it, it's two years, as you say. Yeah. If you just said a few months, yeah. they might go maybe, and then stay maybe, for two maybe. years. In fact, I, you know, we're seeing in the United States in particular a trend, an ex absolute explosion of extended business travelers. Yep. So this gets, I think, somewhat to what you were referring to, to two years to the Utes, God love them, is an eternity, right? Yeah. Um, and the prevailing um, sort of research indicates that they want to change jobs, not necessarily companies, but jobs every 18 to 24 months. So I think organizations have embraced an extended business traveler, one from a cost perspective, but it might also be that that is the appetite that the, the younger millennials and the Generation Z, so Generation Z is 19 and 20 and under, are, are able to get their arms around. So that being said, I'm very, very bullish on mobility. It's just a different mobility than what we might have experienced five years ago, right? And, th and that in itself brings a challenge because one of the topics in the Immigration Day on Tuesday was stealth expats, which right. yeah. is the business traveler. Yes. It's kind of gone wrong. Yeah. Um, and that's a big issue that has to be dealt with yeah. uh, all over the place. I'm not sure that it's the business traveler that's gone wrong. And I said this, I was, I was speaking on the panel at the immigration session on Monday. Um, and 
I think that, and to the point that we had in our trends report last year, Tad, government is not keeping up with the needs of yeah. business. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the issue. It's not, it's not that we've got, yes, we've got people wandering around the world, but, uh, and it's difficult to track those people, but we've got this archaic um, view on, on migration and, and immigration that migrants are coming in to steal jobs from, do, from the domestic workforce, uh, and it's just not true. Um, migrants, highly skilled migrants, the talent that we need, um, every single country is talking about a shortage of skilled people. Mm -hmm. uh, from Malaysia, Thailand, China, India, South Africa, Canada, the United States, the UK, mm -hmm. and we're all chasing that small percentage of people that are willing to pick up sticks and move. And, and you know, Stephen, that's right, and that's where the, the real gap is, because they're looking for skills. Skills means experience. But meanwhile, that, that, that number of people willing to do that is decreasing, while we have another group that has no skills and no experience, and they're willing to travel. That's so right. What are you going to offer to them? How are you going to make sure that, that somehow they get what they want, because they want to learn those skills, right? First off, I'm going to invite you to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue to make a speech. That's the White House. <laughs> you <know>. um, <laughs> our, our prime minister can do it far more eloquently uh, yeah, than I can. Yeah, that's <laughs> very true. And he's that's far more charismatic true. than yeah, I am. Yeah, he, and far he's younger than I am. Yeah. So I think he should go. Yeah. Um, but I think the other point that, that you were picking up on around the, this divergence of you, you've got the youth that want to go that are unskilled, so to speak, and then you've got the, the more seasoned individuals that have the skills but don't want to go. It, so I was talking to some colleagues um, in, in uh, sort of in the global travel arena in the HR space, and I was asking them, you know, you know if, if the United States puts a cap on the H-1Bs, what are you going to do? So there's much more energy now going on again, in the United States, around retraining of the entire population that's been dispersed, as you're talking about. And so some companies, um, Google announced Howard University West, so a training program in Washington, D.C. at Howard University. Microsoft is playing around with coal miners to coders. So, there's, so companies are saying, if this is what's going to occur in the immigration, we still need talent. We better figure out then how we're going to make this happen. So I think you're going to see companies get creative in their training and taking on a more um, nationalist view around training of the population. That's the United States, by the way. Training of the population as opposed to just their own employees. So I, I think that's something we, we should pay attention to a little I'm bit. Sure, there will be solutions to that, but how will it affect our industry? That's my, my, my concern, of course. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 it's, that's it's the, the thing. The changing profile of, yeah. of our customers. Exactly. In, in, in a place as large as the United States, it might it's kick start a domestic, a domestic it's activity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But how's that going to affect the rest of us yeah. out, out in the rest of the world? And I'm sure, you know, we're going to see some changes um, in the UK, whether we like them or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but hopefully, sense will prevail. And we will see, <laughs> we will hopefully, live in hope. And we'll see uh, a sensible arrangement yeah. in place, allowing people to move, uh, continue to move around Europe. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I mean, I, I personally believe that, you know, uh, the bre Brexit was based on, on a lot of nonsense um, and people making things up. But there we go. That's just my view. I've done my polit political <laughs> bit. Uh, the, the insecurity, I think, is, is, is the, the word here. Yes. Um, Brexit will happen and it will happen, but it should happen faster because then the insecurity goes away. When there's insecurity and, and companies don't know where to invest their money, you're going to go to a standstill. It, in, in general, our industry, whether it's moving relocation, every time there's a crisis somewhere around the world, we pick the fruits because people want to move because of that. And that's great. And, and after six months, they come to census again, and they move back again. Great. And we've got some revenue coming in again. Yeah. That's fantastic. So I shouldn't say that, but we do like a, like a crisis every now and then. But if there is insecurity and they don't know where to invest their money in, yes. then we come to a standstill mm -hmm. and nothing is happening. And that's for Brexit and, and now it's going to be elections. And I think they're yes. just going to delay the problem a bit longer of insecurity before they go to the full Brexit. And that's actually not good for the economy no. and not good for us, I think. And, and it shortens the period in which the negotiation can take place yeah. because the new government has to be in place before it can start. Mm -hmm. 
But Jesse, you know, going back to your earlier point about what's going to then happen to our industry, I, you know, what's not lost on me, Tony Chapman, your keynote gentleman, that the, the um, video about I was made in New York but born in Denmark statement. So I, I got, I follow a lot of population replacement rates because I believe that, you know, there will be movement to where there's populace and, and active bodies to be able to fill these roles. Um, so I think there's still, it still will occur, but what you might see is, you know, jobs moving in different geographies because mm -hmm. there is available talent there. So, you know, you might see some stuff. I, so I, I'm still very bullish. I mean, if you look at Ethiopia, their population replacement rates at 5.9. You know, so they've got, they, their number one asset is their people. They may not yet be trained, but they've got people. Whereas the United States, we sit at 2.1 and places in continental Europe, 1.7. So sub. So you're going to see some shifts and, and more and more governments are getting creative around procreation. I decided after that Tony Chapman thing to go back to my room and Google the whole mo make mom campaign. Mm -hmm. Woo, you Danish people. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. And you know what? Just for kicks and giggles, go back this afternoon at, at, or tonight and go look at that. But they've actually now tracked where you've had more babies, right? I mean, it, it's like, oh, my. It, it, yeah, and so they're play, paying for getaway romantic weekends. But these are really interesting. Yeah, right? But then they've tracked where they've had more babies. So it, it, Singapore's doing some similar stuff, not quite to that degree. But things where they're trying to make it attractive to us at the cost of having kids and stuff. So I think countries are recognizing they're going to have a population issue. You used to be able to offset that with immigration. But if you close your borders, you better start cranking out babies. <laughs> and those, but those are long term. Yeah, it's a right? generation I mean, away. It's another 20 30, years, 30 right? years away. those people are it. going to enter the workforce. Yeah. So yeah. if we've got this true. hurdle to get through. We can, um, because uh, this is all fascinating stuff. But the guys in here represent the mobility industry. So what can we, the mobility industry, do where we can to actually facilitate this, the moving of people from one place to another? And how do we design, or how, how do you believe that we should move our programs to get people moving to, to, to encourage the people who say, I'm not moving um, be, and that for any reason, how do we get them to do it? How do we move forward? What do we do? Do we develop more spousal support, educational support, that kind of thing? How do we go? Where do we go from here? Uh, well, I think, I think two things. Um, and I, um, maybe this, I think at a, a high, you know, kind of big picture level on some of these things. But I think, number one, business has to be at the table with government. We have to impress upon government how important mobility is to the success of the business, but more importantly, to building the, uh, the economic prosperity of the country. And in, our, in, in Canada, I'll use Canada, uh, I said there were two things, but I'll use Canada as, as an example of that. We've been pushing the, the issue around immigration, our declining uh, birth rate, our repl you know, the replacement rate, mm -hmm. um, Stats Canada, for example, uh, issued a report uh, recently. That's our labor, you know, they do the labor stats and everything. And they said that, you know, it, without immigration, by 2030, uh, we'll see absolutely no growth in our labor force. Uh, by 2030, there will be only two working people for every retiree. In 2010, that ratio was four to one. So the next 15 years is going to drop two to one. Um, so we've been pushing this idea and this need for immigration and the need for skilled workers uh, for the last 10 years. We now have a new government in place. They are using the same language that we have been using all of that time. You know, talking about bringing in the intellectual capital, mm -hmm. talking about developing an innovation agenda, talking about we have new immigration programs. We have a global skills strategy. We have a global talent stream. We're also reducing uh, the requirements of work permits. Uh, and it's all aimed at getting the brightest and the best to our shores. I th you, know, you made the point earlier, or somebody made the point Thank earlier, you. about you know, the countries that can take advantage, yep. you know, not close their doors, open their doors. And to this point, at this point in time, uh, we're doing that. 
Um, our population is, be is behind the government. That could change if we get bad news stories out there about uh, banks or insurance companies using offshore workers and displacing uh, Canadians. See, so that, that may be true in, 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 in Canada and the US. I think in Europe, I see a totally different picture of it. As soon as you use the word immigration in Europe, people freeze up. Yeah. If you look at the election, elections the last few months and, and the coming months uh, as well, as likely, there's more and more nationalism, and it's all about immigration. And you can explain to them that you need brains and et cetera, that you need highly intellectual people. It kind of freezes as soon as they hear the word immigration, and they're actually closing up. <coughs> and I think that's what happened with, that was what motivated some of the vote on yeah, Brexit. Absolutely, right? absolutely. So, sorry, but the, uh, do, and I'll finish. There, so there are two points uh, that I think are necessary. So number one, business has to be at the table. Number two, business has really got to get its head around the strategic value of mobility to growth, business growth, getting product to market, um, and establishing their, you know, their business operations. And I don't think that they take it seriously enough. Uh, so it, it, and as mobility professionals, if there are things that we can be doing, whether you're a supply partner or whether you're a corporate a mobility uh, manager, um, it's getting that message to the senior levels of business. And I, I, th I think that's one of the most important things that we can do uh, as individuals in the industry and as industry leaders, as you know, through our associations. I know that you guys talk a lot about this, so. Yeah. I'll pick up, I think we've, we've hit the immigration, the, the immigration horse pretty hard here, but yes, really take indeed. it down, um, pick up a little bit on your second comment and then share a couple of other observations, I would say. Um, your second comment about aligning it to the business objectives, I absolutely completely agree. The quicker we can continue to align the need for mobility to a business outcome, the easier it's going to be to keep our program sustained. So I, I totally agree. But let me, let me shift the pivot a little bit more, maybe tactically, to what you were asking, which is I believe we need flexibility and choice. So we're still, I think, largely driven about here's a tiered policy, here's what you're going to get, da 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 da. That quite candidly ex, ex, um, extended business travelers kind of took that and sort of, again, dispersed of that. So when I say flexibility, let somebody choose what it is that they want. Let them choose their benefits. Let, the, let them have choice. So it's going to get to, you know, your second or third slide in there around, you know, what's the reluctance. There's a, there's a, a human behavioral element. If I have choice, sometimes that, that lowers it. But if you say, I'm going to give you these seven benefits versus I can choose you might find, I think, a little bit more active engagement around that for sure. So I would, I would offer. I think we've got to get, we've got to get really, really good about um, just allowing that. You know. Yeah, but it's it's not so much us. It's the it's the corporates. Why well, we I'm, have got I'm to give yeah the I, I right. But you know what though, Tad, I'm going to challenge us. It is the corporate people, but we have a responsibility to help educate them. We what do. if we one do do your do your businesses, you, if you're an RMC or DSP, do you have the technology that will allow a corporate person to do that choice? And two, great, if you do, you should be in there and telling them about it. You should be telling them about why that's going to make their program that much more effective. So I think we have a responsibility to help move that needle. Um, that, that, that is as maybe, but I think that the message was, which was coming across yesterday to a certain degree in the RMC uh, DSP forum yeah. was that the, the, these RFPs that are coming out are being written by people who basically haven't got a clue. Right. And however much they're trying to persuade those people to uh, alter what they're saying, they're, they're so driven by um, ensuring that they go down in history as getting the best uh, deal possible uh, that they're not really listening. So it's really going, we've got to go back up, much higher up the scale to the CEOs in the boardroom saying to them, if you want to be more successful in more places and get that talent to all those different places, you've got to, you've got to be investing more money in getting them from one place to another because as we all know, if you get it right, it, you really get it right. And if you get it wrong, you really get it wrong. And I think uh, to what Steve said, as an industry organization, we have that 
responsibility as well to do the very same thing and reach out to those end customers, whether they'll be procurement or whether they're global mobility people, reach out to them and show them what it's all about. Yeah. And, and, and at Feedy, we've changed that in the past year, which we never did before. We usually were very inward looking. We're now outward looking. We're looking out for these customers and we're telling them what it's all about. And, and, and that's important, I think, as an industry organization to do that. Yeah, you know, the other thing that's going on in some companies, um, I, I'll pick on the West Coast of the United States, I, I'm a little bit biased there. I think they, positively biased, I think they do have the most progressive mindset around mobility. But here's some of the things that they're doing with mobility, not just in benefits, they're actually wrapping mobility into performance management. So if you achieve certain business objectives, your, your reward, instead of it being stock or compensation, is a mobility assignment, six months or something like that. So, so companies are getting creative with mobility. You've got Workday. Um, many of you probably maybe use their platform, an HRIS system, that is when you come onto their company, every single employee is guaranteed a two-week sprint to Ireland. They have a location in Ireland. So businesses are getting smart in the H broad HR space about how to leverage mobility. And I think we need to, you know, continue to help them in that space. Right. So I, I think the dialogue is, is beginning to so, occur. So effectively, they're giving people a taste of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. because they recognize the, the, the younger millennials and the Generation Z that we talked about want that global resume. And so they finally have said, how can we turn mobility into a benefit that is going to appeal to them? Yeah. So, you know, I think, I think those two are, are doing it in a brilliant way. You know, tying it to performance management so it's an incentive rather than, oh, we need you on a project in Beijing for two years. It's, how did you do on your performance? And at the end, we'll give you this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's creative. So we need, we need that to spread across the world yeah. into other places. We're starting in California, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, but those changes are already happening. And if we, if we look from the mover side, uh, we, we've seen in the past few years that, that the number of moves is increasing. But they're smaller and they're shorter. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're not a little bit smaller, but they're much more smaller. And it just has to do with, and then to the, for the movers, I'm sorry, it's good that we have more moves going on, but the volume is getting smaller because those young people, they do not have any value in worldly goods. They don't really care about worldly goods. I mean, if you, why would you move an IKEA table when you can buy a new one in China? Why would you move it? They have no emotional attachment to that. But that's for a mover, that's kind of a, a big thing happening. So. You got more people moving with the same admin cost, the same effort you have to put into, but with a lot sm smaller uh, move and a smaller revenue as well. So that's something that we need to tackle as well. Now, um, before I ask the audience to ask that's us right, questions, I oh yes, I just want to ask. I, I I want to gaze a little into the future. So now, Jesse, these millennials mm. um, who don't want to move their IKEA table today, what are they going to be like in? 15 years time when they've got a wife and three children, are they going to be like the older generation as of today, or are they themselves going to be different? Well, I hope so, uh, that <laughs> they will change, and that they will start dragging their furniture all around the world, that's fantastic, that will be good news. I have a doubt though, I, I'm not so sure. I, I'm, look at the technology today, um, Frankly, my wife used to hate when I was traveling because she would not see me for two weeks. But nowadays, you go on Skype and she can see you. So she always tells me, it's not that bad, we got Skype. Will that happen in the future as well? That, you know, technology will take over part of that? Will it be needed that we start moving all around the world? I don't know. And that's why it's important for, for, for relocation companies as well as moving companies to recognize that changing profile and start adapting your programs to that. Start adapting your, 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 your product portfolio to that to make sure that somehow you can still serve them whether in a slightly different capacity or, or with, with, with fast moves going around the world, small ones, whatever, you need to adapt that. But first you've got to recognize it, that it's happening. I think we've been, we're kind of an old industry, the movers, obviously, and, and we've been for a long time very conservative and, 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 and thinking that the world would not change. But I think that's now changing very rapidly. Um, we did a survey of our membership uh, four years ago, five years ago, I mean, you were there again in India? That's longer ago. We did a survey how many of our members were offering DSP services. Back then, it was less than 30%. We did a recent survey just a few months ago. It's 65% of our members are now offering this DSP or visa immigration or, or relocation services as a whole, assignment management, whatever. All kinds of stuff is happening. They recognize that there's a problem, possibly for the future, and they're adapting to that. Good. And Peggy? 
You know, I would say, you know, as I, as I look out to the crystal ball, I, I continue to go back to, I'll pick up, Jesse, your comment earlier about the, the, the downside of people not having a lot of furniture is that they want a lot of experiences. Well, you can't get a lot of experiences in your own neighborhood. So I think as companies, if they can, if they can position their marketing around it being an experience-driven organization, so in other words, you're going to get an experience in Warsaw. You're going to get an experience in Moscow. You're going to get an experience in San Francisco. They're going to get people at the door. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know what? I think it's about flexibility is going to be a lot more. I, unfortunately, Jesse, I don't think you're going to see a 20,000-pound move again. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, times. but you're going to see a lot more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, so, yeah, I think it's going to be very, very bullish. Very different, but bullish. And Steve? Yeah, I, th I think so too. I think it's an exciting time to be a part of this industry. It, it is, uh, it's changing. I, I've been in this position for 15 years. I've seen significant shifts in, uh, in the way people are, are moving, but um, business today um, is looking outward. They have to be global. Mm -hmm. um, the markets simply, you just simply, your markets are not big enough. Uh, and so, um, you know, as we found in the survey that we did uh, last year, yep. um, the predictions are that uh, from pretty well all of the consultancies um, is that we're going to see significant growth in, in global mobility. Mm -hmm. To Peggy's point, uh, it's not going to be the models that we've seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, technology, I think, for those firms that um, can harness technology, um, and can come with new and innovative solutions will be the ones that succeed during this period of change. There's another thing that is on the horizon, and that is the use of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and the number of jobs that that is going to displace. Um, and I don't think this industry is going to be immune yeah. from that. I mean, you'll, we'll be seeing driverless cars, by 2020, yep. um, you know, some cities are adopting that r rather aggressively. Uh, so, I, you know, I think it's going to have an impact on the on the uh, trucking, uh, the moving industry. Um, we're seeing it in the financial services sectors, the insurance okay. sectors. So, all of the stuff that's being that that is transactional, um, I think that that's going to be change. Day, you know, that's going to change. It's going to be automated. And companies that embrace that and get on with it and come back to the companies with the solutions. Mm -hmm. To your point around, you know, getting the strategic decision makers to understand the value of this. Yes. Not showing here's the latest spreadsheet mm -hmm. things that yes. we have. It's getting into the, the headspace, if you will, of those decision makers and explaining how valuable this is mm -hmm. yep. to their business success. Well, um, as I've said many times, relocation makes the world go round. Mm -hmm. And let's hope it continues. Yeah. Anyway, do we have any questions? Oh, we have one over there. Michelle. Michelle. Past president and doyen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that was very interesting. To Peggy's point in particular, I'm working with a trial scheme with a large governmental office in the Netherlands which is using mobility support for, re for talent management. And I've never come across it before and mm. I was lucky enough to come in at the right moment. And um, I think this is the way you have to not only talk to HR, you have to talk to other people within companies to see where the button has to be pressed. And I don't think HR managers, they, they know what they know, but you have to awaken them to what might be possible. And therefore, I, when I'm looking for work, I look at other people in the company besides the HR. Just to reiterate what you said, I think is happening. Thank you. Nice to know the Dutch are doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Not like the Danish, though. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Oh. Couple here. Oh, Ronald. Um, it seems to be three different um, sort of 
conflicting potentially uh, results from the survey. The first one is saying there's a decline in the willingness to move. Then you referenced, Steve, the consulting companies who are all predicting growth, and then we throw in the AI replacing a bunch of jobs. Have you seen any data that sort of pulls this all together and, and tells us what the size of the pie is for us as an industry and whether that's increasing or decreasing? Um, I have seen some numbers on that. Um, and let me, just, let me just filter back through your, through your question. The consultancies that I referred to, they were asking the companies, will, you, will your employees be more global? Mm -hmm. The expectation is, yes, we value global experience. We need our leaders to have global experience. Mm -hmm. This survey that we did was of the willingness of people to do that. So you're looking at the same question. You're looking at it from a, a different, through a different lens. Um, so you, you've got the expectation that the companies are going to need the people, but are the people willing to, to go? Um, your second point about the, the growth of our industry, I read a report recently that suggests that our industry is going to grow. I think the numbers right now are the value of the, the mobility industry globally is somewhere in the neighborhood of $25 billion in terms of economic activity. Please don't quote me on that number. I will, I will give it to Tad and you will, uh, but, and, and we're seeing some growth of about seven billion over the next four or five years. Um, on your third point about artificial intelligence, um, it's, it's a train that's coming at us uh, and, and it's going to displace a lot of people. Um, it won't, replace creative people, but it will replace the people where um, you, we're processing information, we're processing transactions, more so than ever in the past. Does that make sense? It does, thank you. See, to, um, to, in, uh, to uh, add to that, if there are perhaps less people de uh, interested in going, maybe those who are interested are more determined to go. Yeah, and, and therefore yeah. there's still a large uh, number of people willing to go. And if, if you recognize now that about one out of ten expats are millennials, that will rise dramatically. And, 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 and those expats that used to be there, they were teachers back then because they were teaching their skills in, in, in other areas. They become students actually absorbing the skills from the other areas. And that's why we also see that whole shift that the US and Europe going everywhere around the world. Now they go anywhere. Mm. You've got people coming in from Asia into Europe, which we never had before. And that's just fantastic to see that. So I think that we're, we're, we're drilling into whole new resources here. So there will be more, I'm, I'm convinced of that. And that's what the Future of Mobility report showed, that people were coming from different places. Yes. Now, anybody else? A couple of hands. Oh, there's one here, down the front. Christian, oh no, here comes Bryony, here too. Right there, Fiona. Yeah. Yeah. Rohini. Um, so I'm a millennial myself, and from the trend it says that the workforce is going to be a whole lot more millennials, and our mindset is slightly different, and we embrace faster technology and probably artificial intelligence in the future. So do, what kind of an impact do you think a large millennial workforce will have on mobility and relocation? I'll take the first swag at that, and please, I mean, Rohini, I, I would just say I think it's going to be very positive. I think it's going to, I think, again, the younger millennials, so I'm going to call them 26, you know, and in, in younger, to the Generation Z, which is 20 and younger, I think are going to push the velocity of mobility greater than anything. I mean, we've watched the adoption, and I can't remember the stats, but I'm sure we've all seen it, of the amount of data that sits out there, how it's like in whatever, it's like some quadruple thing, big long number thing. So I think it's just only going to continue. They're going to continue to push and push and push and push and push and push. So the velocity, um, I, I think, will be there. They, they, the, no matter what, though, there's nothing that I've seen on the horizon that suggests they don't want to see a global or have a global experience. Even with stand, notwithstanding Steve's numbers, the, the next level down on that is why is there reluctance? Is it because right now there's all this uncertainty that um, 
Jesse talked about this fear sort of thing. Oh, you know, when there's fear, everybody wants to stay home kind of thing. That, that'll swing back. We only want to stay home and see our neighbors for so long, right? So I, I think you guys are going to push us to be even better citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being a millennial. Darn it. <laughs> and uh, Fiona. Thanks very much. I was very interested in Michelle's comment um, about uh, wider than HR people being interested in global mobility. And that's certainly our experience at Relocate Global over the last two or three years. And um, certainly companies have got good news stories and the HR and mobility support those. But it's quite an interesting tip is to track the good news stories that are coming out via the PR, via the marketing stories in national newspapers, in general management. And so certainly our publication is, is definitely covering more general management growth stories. So we're about growth and positivity. And then when you reach out to those PR and marketing per people, they are more than willing to link in the HR people and the talent people who can often be a bit shy and retiring. So my question to you is, have you thought of that as a strategy within your organizations? And uh, what sort of steps would you put in place to embrace the wider business strategies across your corporate members? See, we, well, we do that all the time. Uh, it's, it's just part of our DNA. That's, that's uh, how we reach out to corporations and we uh, talk very much about the strategic value of mobility to business success. It's a message that we're con constantly uh, communicating back to the business community, uh, both through our memberships, um, uh, op-eds for the national uh, magazines and, and media uh, to, to, to get that out. I, I would only just, I mean, I echo exactly we try to do uh, sort of a similar pathway at Worldwide ERC. The only thing I would say, though, is I don't think collectively as an industry, and, and I hold myself and our organization kind of, I don't think we do enough. I think this gets back to we have to help train them as well. I think there's a responsibility to the industry to do that. So if it's, you know, doing things that shows them how to have that conversation with leadership, um, how to do it in a different way, how to turn mobility into an incentive rather than an expense. I mean, I, I don't think we do enough. So, you know, there's always more work to be done in this space and helping to help them understand how you create that business alignment, what's the language you'd want to use. Um, there are some natural pathways we've already talked about um, in here, but we're not doing enough. If you've got ideas, we'll take them. And I, I think I, you've, you've just triggered a thought in, in, in my response to that question as well. And, and it, it, it is this, that if only about 10% of the companies, and I'm being generous, only about 10% of the companies actually can track the return on investment yeah. of the assignment costs. Mm -hmm. And so you, it, 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 is, it is seen as a cost. It is not seen as an investment in most companies. As suppliers, as supplier partners, if you can help crack that nut, then you are bringing value to the table mm -hmm. because companies are struggling to figure out how to do that. Well, there was a perfect example of that yesterday. Um, in the, uh, I think it was Adri from BGRS was talking about the supply, the one of their suppliers who came back and said, market rents in our, in our location have gone down. Can we go back and renegotiate all the leases? And the company said, it's a no-brainer, go ahead, because we're going to save money. Right. Now, it, it is it's, it's astounding, and, and I, I come from a sales function before, and, and when we would be talking to corporate um, um, HR people, many of them do not have a clue how many expats they have, where they are in the world, what the cost is. Right. And absolutely, Steve, you're right. If you can hold that mirror up for them and not talk about your company, but about them, and actually tell them how many expats they have and where they are, then they're on your side, and then you can start influencing them as well, as well and to show them the merits of, of this and the benefits of having that expat, po expat population. And absolutely, uh, uh, Peggy, what you said, uh, I, I, I echo that. Uh, as an industry, we need to push that forward. We need to use our members to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're very reluctant in doing so, but we need to do all pull together and do the same thing. And we can, it's great that we sit here together. We're not fighting because we're, we're good friends, but that's what we should be doing all the time. 
to, to reach yeah. out to, to, those, to those corporate people, to the procurement people as well specifically, because they have a big, big uh, influence in this whole process.